Okay. How would you sum up this first paragraph? And anyone other than Megan, feel free to go ahead and jump in. Okay, do you remember our previous conversations about utilitarian philosophy? Anyone remember that? Utilitarianism is usually associated with the phrase, the greatest good for the greatest number. And to provide you with a little bit of history, which we've kind of touched on in past classes. The short form of the title of the book is De Veritate, which means the truth. The book rejected the validity of any a priori view of human being or the world it also rejected the validity of scripture in terms of how scripture is applied to human existence. If you remember, when we talk about a priori, So when we use the word a priori, we mean beforehand, a conception that precedes experience. And Herbert's point is that we end up finding exactly what we expect to. Okay, any questions so far? Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So what he proposed instead, you may recall, was an a, pri a posteriori approach to understanding what it means to be human. 
So a posteriori is derived from experience or from observation. There is kind of a veiled assumption Apart from human experience, the world is meaningful. It's not ar arbitrary. And that ultimately, there is a kind of logic to it all. Because it is intelligible. And ultimately, he would want to argue that the source of that intelligibility would be God, except almost immediately, it broke down. It broke down because of the realization that our perception of the world is subjective. So without a concept of the good, which exists before we look at the world, the question became, how do we look at the world? How do we know what to do? How do we know what's moral and immoral, and right and wrong? And how do we know what it means to be human? Well, Two men begin to write at almost the same time. Um, interestingly, the only thing that we have from Gay is 13 pages from a draft of his dissertation. He went on to become a preacher in a church and pretty much disappears into oblivion. Hutchison, however, continues to write and to work. And Hutchison argued that we could literally compute mathematically and this gave rise to a phrase you might have heard called utilitarian calculus the work of hutchison and gay the rise of what will be called utilitarianism equates utility with happiness. And the concept of happiness is going to be adapted from Aristotle. More about that momentarily.
so a number of different philosophers over the next hundred years will continue to work on trying to formulate exactly what the greatest good for the greatest number would be. And that's where we got next in line would be Jeremy Bentham. For Bentham, it wasn't the greatest good, it was the greatest pleasure. Now, we want to keep in mind that what Bentham meant by pleasure is not quite the same thing that we understand pleasure to be in the modern world. It's closer to Aristotle's concept of happiness. All right, are there any questions so far before? I go further. No? Okay. So, Jeremy Bentham might have died in, in obscurity if it weren't for James Mill, the father of John Stewart. Um, James Mill was a kind of collector of influential people. And he gathered a number of intellectuals around Jeremy Bentham. Now, interestingly, James Mill and Bentham read the work of a German by the name of von Humboldt. Von Humboldt believed that it was possible to program a child in its mother's womb by playing classical music and reading it Latin, Greek, and French, and whatever else. And sure as hell, that's what they did when John Stuart Mill's mother became pregnant. In his early 20s, he had a complete mental breakdown. And he credited Thomas Carlyle with rescuing him, reading Carlyle's poetry from a life of depression. They would eventually engage in an intense intellectual debate over the nature of slavery and race. Carlyle was <laughs> unbelievably racist. We'll just let it go at that. So John Stuart Mill eventually published two very important books. And on liberty, he said, the only function of government
is to protect individual rights. And together, he advances two principles. Principle of harm and the principle of redress. The principle of harm very simply says, unless you can conclusively prove that what I'm about to do will hurt you, stay out of my life. And conversely, unless I can prove that what you're doing will hurt me, I have no recourse. So if you look at contemporary American society and you wonder why we have the right to do whatever it is we want to do, you can credit Mr. Mill with that. So you can't make me wear a mask and you can't tell me not to buy that gun and you cannot tell me not to cancel someone. Um, you can't tell me anything. If it's right for me, damn it's right. The principle of redress said that when a harm occurs, when a harm occurs, it is the function of government to fix it. Very simply put. So, when you think about contemporary American culture, to a great extent, it's utilitarianism in general, and John Stuart Mill in specific, um, that significantly contributed to the reality of the fact that we can't make moral decisions. If you can justify it, go do it. Um, I also don't want to make it sound like it's purely conservative because woke culture is a function of this. My body, my choice is a function of this. Um, and I would argue that progressive left and the populist right are simply different sides of the same coin. Leave me alone. You can't tell me what to do. I'll do whatever it is I want. Only the ideology is different. Okay, let me stop there. Um, question so far, is this helpful? Nicole, what do you think? Is this helpful? Okay, uh, Whitley, helpful? Yes, it is very helpful. Okay. It's a little confusing. Um, I'm trying to take a lot of notes. Okay, well, let me not go forward then. Uh, where is it confu confusing and how can I clear it up a little bit? Oh my goodness. Well, think about it. Well, we have a chat. Let's see what we've got here. Okay. Think about it this way. All ideas change over time. And if I say something today, over the next hundred years, people will reinterpret that to fit their experience. Does that make sense so far? Yeah. Okay, so if we go back to Aristotle,
humans seek happiness and happiness is the highest human good. So when we talk about the initial formulation of the greatest good for the greatest number, we want to make humans happy. The problem is we can't make everyone happy. It's impossible on multiple fronts. So if this is the first point and this is the second point, then the, then the conclusion becomes, okay, let's do the best we can Which means, let's make as many people happy as we can. And of course, while they're trying to figure out what this means, the concept of happiness changes. For example, what this means in 2022 is not what it meant in 1905. Happiness now might mean a new iPhone, a new Galaxy S22. It could mean all kinds of things that didn't even exist in the world in 1905. And part of what the author is also saying in that article is that it's also become very subjective. See, part of what we've lost is that for Aristotle, the only way that we can be happy is by being virtuous. But by the time we get to 2022, happiness has nothing to do with being virtuous. And because there's no norm by which to judge happiness, it's totally subjective. That's how we make a consumer-based economy work. Go out and be happy. Be happy by buying. Buy what? Well, buy everything we want you to buy. That whole artificial need thing. Okay. Whitley, is this better? Is this helpful? Yes. Okay. Anyone else have any questions so far? No. Okay. I don't. Uh-huh. No, okay. so I don't have any question right now. I'm sorry, say that again, please. I want to say I don't have any question right now. Okay. So if we go back to that paragraph, laissez faire is hands off. So basically what they're saying is that in the end, it comes down to attempting to make a decision based upon a trade-off the good versus the cost. So the point that he's making is we attempt to quantify the good and we also at the same time are sort of saying what is the price per individual 
So if we're going to make a few people happy and the cost is extremely high, don't do it. But if we make a lot of people high, happy, um, the cost is not high. Yes. And part of the argument he's making here is that ultimately a good social philosophy, good policy enhances the good of many people. A bad social policy does not. But the question he's dealing with, is there really anything that's scientific and or value free? So, the implicit question is, No. If we knew what the truth was, if there were an a priori definition of what it means to be human, then there would be a sense of objectivity. And we could make a decision that was truly value free. But We live in a subjective world. So to go back to John Stuart Mill for a minute. At the same time Mill was writing, There's an attempt to counter John Stuart Mill and to counter social Darwinism, which we've talked about, started by George Jacob Holyoke called Secularism. And in the 20th century, it will become humanism. In 1932, they published the first humanist manifesto. Beginning at the end of the First World War, there's a realization that Christianity is the main Christian churches are becoming less and less effective and they don't know how to respond to the social problems of the day. So the World Council of Churches is founded. 
they are not successful. And in 1954, they published a paper on social justice, which essentially says, we need to pass more responsibility for, for the world to our members. And we need to teach them how to make moral decisions. So by the time we get to the 1950s, the mainline Western culture is beginning a serious decline. In 1963, Fletcher uh, publishes a book called Situational Ethics. In that book, he argues that intention and consequence don't matter. They're not relevant. to making a moral decision. The moment or the situation is normative. And by that he means the only way you can make a decision is within the context of the situation in which you find yourself. And according to Fletcher, you make that decision based upon two forms of love. except there are a number of major problems. Intended or not, actions have consequences. <laughs> Excuse me, and you own them. You will be held responsible for them. So by the end of the 1960s, So situational ethics becomes, if it feels good, do it, <coughs> which is essentially saying, in this moment, right here, right now, thinking about neither consequence nor intention, if it feels good, you have a moral obligation to do it. And by 1988, with Nike's famous hedonism campaign, don't even think about that. Just do it. So this is largely why, starting in 1624, um, the West has become morally bankrupt.
And free market capitalism, according to the article we're reading, is essentially no more than this. Go forth and do whatever you want to do. And don't regulate it, by the way. Don't tell me what to do. Don't you go passing a law telling me I can't sell cigarettes. No, 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 no. All right, questions, thoughts, comments. Have you thought about any of this? Kayla, what do you think? Nothing, just trying to digest it all. It is a lot to take in, so... Okay. Is there anything I can make clearer for you? No. <laughs> no, not right now. No. Okay. Just, yeah. Okay. Ashari? Are you there? Are you able to talk tonight or are you busy? Okay. I'll assume she is. Uh, Dahlia, what do you think? I think it's pretty interesting. I mean, we're seeing it happening right now, like you mentioned, with Nike and their slogan, just do it. Uh -huh. I think uh -huh. it's pretty interesting. It makes sense. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Anyone else? Whitley, are you okay with all this? I'm going to be completely honest with you. <laughs> Every okay. time that I sit on these lectures, I, I just realize like how not smart I am. <laughs> oh, no, no, don't, don't say that. Um, you know, number one, I'm a gearhead. And number two, um, when other people are out enjoying life, I'm reading books from 300 years ago. What can I tell you? <laughs> so please don't put yourself down. Is there anything about this that I can clarify to help you? I mean, I feel like this right here is a review of what we've already talked about. Mm -hmm. um, the situational ethics and then um just basically going into detail about um get out of my face no you're doing fine, you're doing fine. <laughs> i'm sorry my cat is in my face <laughs> oh that's okay but yeah just going through and talking about um the western culture declining and then um intentions will have a consequence and um just explaining the moral decisions and um yeah <laughs> okay so do you see how free market capitalism fits into this kind of hands-off model if you yeah. think about if it feels good do it or just do it Mm -hmm. If you think about oh. this, I'm sorry, go ahead. So basically what you're saying is that like that's, I'm going to try to explain the best way that I can. <laughs> that you're that doing is, fine. That's like the intention that they're setting out into the world. Like that's the vibe that they're giving everybody is it's okay. Just do it. Like go out and spend yeah. all this money on this phone. Go in get your nails done, you know, it's okay, it's fine, just do it. Yeah. And if you think about it, in business, when we talk about an ROI, a return on investment, we're basically looking at a transaction and we're asking ourselves,
what good do I get for the money I'm about to spend? Which is a utilitarian question. And the concept behind the free market What does it mean that the market will decide? Well, what it means ultimately is I'm looking for the exact word here. Okay, if a company brings a product to market the price of the market or the price of the widget is a reflection on the happiness or good the product has. If it's perceived to have a lot of value and a lot of happiness and a lot of good, a lot of people are going to buy it. If it's not, they won't. And we're back to what is referred to as a cost benefit analysis. You know, before I buy that new laptop, what is the benefit? What am I going to do that I can't do now? And how much am I willing to pay for that? And the author of the article is saying that's basically utilitarian calculus. So free market capitalism is arguing that if it doesn't generate a product or a company doesn't generate enough value, no one will buy its product. And therefore the market is self-regulating and it doesn't need the government. In fact, the argument made by a couple of the people in the article is that any form of regulation interferes with the market and that it will ultimately result in a greater harm except how do we know what that is how do we quantify it um go back for example to He published a book called Unsafe at Any Speed in the 1960s. Before the publication of this book, So if you were hitting back, there was no headrest. You'd end up with whiplash, which could permanently debilitate you. 
there was no safety glass. And since there were no seat belts, if you were hit in the back, after your head snapped back, your face would go through the windshield and you'd be killed. Or your head would hit the metal dashboard, smash your face, and kill you. And some of the pickup trucks um, had the gas tank behind the front seat. Um, in a car called a Ford Pinto, if you were hit in the rear, the gas tank would come down, slide under the car, and explode and kill you. And Chevy had a car called a Corvair. Um, Air-cooled rear-engine car, if you got hit in the back, the engine would come through the back seat and crush you. And if the market were truly self-regulating, then people wouldn't have bought unsafe cars. But the other problem with the free market that people know enough to make an informed decision. Like buying a car without headrests, safety glass, no seat belts, metal dashboards. Yeah. People don't. And if you add to that, the fact that in a free market, The function of marketing is to create and promote artificial needs. So how can you make an informed consent? How do you really know? Uh, by the way, um, anybody signed up for Verizon, AT&T, or T-Mobile's 5G in your home? Have you read the fine print, anyone? Okay, You're, they're right. It's blistering fast on the download. But it's 20 megabits on the upload. Brutally slow. <coughs> But they're selling you on the experience of rapidly downloading movie. As if the difference between five or 10 seconds downloading movie is going to kill you. Questions, thoughts, ideas. What can I clarify? I did have a question. I don't mean to... Um go back to things we've talked about, but I'm actually interested when we were talking about the cause benefit analysis and how much is the benefit and any regulations that benefits with the market. What about, what is a good, like if we had to define a good, what would that be? Is that like a byproduct or is that just benefits that benefit the business or organization? Okay, um, I'm working as a consultant for a business right now. 
and the average age of the PC they've got is six years. To replace 15 PCs, they're looking at approximately $800 per PC, including a new monitor. So the cost benefit analysis in this case says, I'm going to spend, oh, $12,000 on PCs. What will I get for that? Okay, well, one of the things we're gonna get is increased productivity. Oh, how do we measure that? Hmm. I don't know. How do you measure productivity? So what they're trying to do is quantify the advantages. Well, the benefits justify or outweigh the cost. For example, I could say, well, right now you're spending 150 a month on PC repairs. Um, so over 12 months, you're going to save about $2,000. Well, no, I mean, you're asking me to spend 12 to save two? No, that's crazy. But if I could show, for example, that I can cut the time in half that it takes to um, run a database search, now it probably would be worth it. Or if new PCs mean that I can go paperless, um, and when I calculate the cost of my office supplies, ink, toner, paper, I'm spending somewhere around $13,000 a year. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Yep, I'll do that. Especially since I can write off the PCs at a better rate than I can write off office supplies. Is this helpful? Yes. Okay. And to some extent, we do this before we buy something. Uh, my car is 12 years old. I'm going to need a transmission. A transmission is $5,000. For $9,000, I can get a five-year-old used car. So why would I spend all that money on a transmission? That's a cost-benefit analysis. We do it a lot. We're just not familiar with the term, probably. Okay, other questions, other thoughts before I go back? Okay. So when you're reading this article, particularly when you get through part A, you want to look at the arguments being made in part two and part B, you want to keep asking yourself whether or not a value-free judgment is possible and whether or not the compensation and unanimity principles apply and whether they are sufficient in and of themselves to justify free market capitalism. When we look at what free market capitalism has done, remember the article that we talked about last week by Turner. In the end, if we're going to use utilitarianism as a guide, then the fact that 
free market capitalism has not lessened inequality, but has actually increased it, becomes a serious problem for free market capitalism. As you read through the article, you also want to ask yourself whether or not there's any information, quantitative information, that truly suggests that government regulation ultimately leads to more expensive product or to a quantifiable harm. One of the arguments frequently made by free market capitalism And two, regulation stifles competition. And I'll give you two industries to think about. Both of these industries were deregulated. The result of deregulation was consolidation. Consolidation has actually resulted in and ultimately has ended up with higher prices. So the facts don't seem to match the contention. Okay, any last questions before I stop the recording and take attendance? I hope this was helpful. Um, that is a particularly important, but also a particularly intense article. Any other questions or comments or thoughts? Okay, if you have any, do remember tomorrow morning and Thursday morning office hours are posted. You are certainly welcome to come by and ask more questions. I'm going to pause the recording and we will go ahead and